whole Facebook and YouTube live event today. Um, going to have a lot of exciting animal clips. I'm not sure if anyone saw our broadcast last night, Nature's Fear Factor, but this event will be all about that film and the exciting work that's going on in Gorongosa National Park. Uh, my name is Suki Bennett. I am NOVA's Senior Digital Editor, and I hope that you all enjoy what we have for you today. Um, before we get started, uh, NOVA, if you're not familiar with who we are, um, we're primarily a broadcast um, science series through PBS. Um, we're produced out of GBH in Boston. Um, we're a lot more than just broadcast. We do a bunch of digital productions, short form videos. We have a large social media presence. So lots of places to find us and consume our content, which we hope is really educational and exciting. Um, so let's see the preview for what we're talking about today. African wilderness out of balance. When you remove predators from the story, things start to unravel. Are you ready? How fear functions in nature was completely unknown. What happens when you put fear back into the equation? Now that nature is coming back, to see this difference is amazing. Nature's Fear Factor on NOVA. So I'm joined, joined by three incredible people today who are all a part of the film. Uh, we have Dominique, Paola, and Senecas here. Uh, they do a mixture of ecology work and also veterinary work in Borongosa National Park. And I think they're really excited about the reintroduction of these uh, African wild dogs into the park. I'm super excited to be speaking with them today. Um, before I was at NOVA, I was pursuing a degree in ecology, so I love this topic. So let's get to know Dominique, Paola, and Tanekis a little bit better. Uh, Dominique, do you wanna start out by introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. I am Dominique Gonsalves, and I am the Elephant Ecology Manager in Gringos National Park. Tanekis? Hi to everyone, I'm Antonio Paul Toneca. I'm senior wildlife vet and wildlife manager in conservation department here in Gorongosa National Park. And Paola. Uh, my name is Paola Boulay, associate director of conservation, also in the department of conservation. And so Nature's Fear Factor is this film that's focused on uh, the reintroduction of this very iconic predator that was lost because of this very long war that took place in Mozambique that really changed the environment and the ecology of this landscape. And we saw a loss of a lot of predators and also a lot of prey species that seemed to be able to rebound a little bit better than those big iconic predators like lions and hyenas and African wild dogs did. So what's so exciting about this reintroduction and why African wild dogs? Why not focus on lions or um, bring back hyenas instead? Who wants to answer that one? <laughs> I know it's complicated. <laughs> um, I can jump in on the carnivore side of things, and I'm sure Tomekish and Dominique can also jump in if you, if you have um, a perspective on it. I think we focus on it all. Um, we're ecologists by training, and what we're here to do is restore an ecosystem. So we don't just focus on wild dogs or hyena or lion, but we focus on the system as a whole. And of course, we have an indigenous population of lions, which are extremely precious. And we've pushed a recovery of that population over the past few years. And they really laid the groundwork for the reintroduction of the wild dogs, which started two years ago. Um, so yeah, we focus on it all. It's never a single species approach. 
Right, that makes sense. How many individual packs of African wild dogs are in Gorongosa now? It seems like they were growing quickly at the end of the film. <laughs> so Nakesh, you wanna jump in? Yes, I can jump in. Uh, now we have uh, four packs and total of individual, we have 83 individual. And 83. Packs. it's a lot. Well, yeah, not. that is a lot. And was that unusual? We saw that the alpha female in the film was actually accepting the pups into the pack from another female. Is that unusual to see? It seems like a rare occurrence. It's not unusual, um, but it is rare. So the thing to appreciate really about wild dogs is they function as a pack. And so you have the alpha female and the alpha male, but you also have beta females and beta males. And in this case, um, in the film where you see the alpha female take in the pups of the beta female, I mean, they're the same pack. So they're taking care of each other. And it's the beauty of a wild dog pack is they work together. They really stick together. So in this case, even though it was rare for a beta female to have pups, um, they were they were welcomed into the pack like right away and taken care of. Right, it seems like a major theme of the film was how lions and African wild dogs really differ as predators. So lions are more stealthy, more individual. Um, they're ambush predators. So they lay in the tall grass and sneak up on warthogs and other things that might be roaming in that area versus the dogs that are very gregarious and all have to work together almost as like a slime mold or a super organism. Um, and so does that play into this importance of having different predators from this large predator guild all being in the park versus just concentrating on one specific kind of predator? Exactly. Yeah, when you're piecing together, back together an ecosystem, um, you learn to appreciate how unique each species is and how they fit into that, the ecology, that web. Um, and so, for example, a lion is a very different predator compared to a wild dog. As you mentioned, a, wild, uh, a lion will ambush its prey in the grass and a wild dog will run sometimes for many miles to catch its prey. And so right away, there are predators that fulfill a unique niche in the ecosystem, right? Um, they each play their own individual roles in the whole ecology and how, how, how the system works. Right, and Dominique, how does this play into elephants? That's your focus. So where do elephants fall within this relationship? Well, uh, I think that's a very important question. And I, I think we still to really to see or to capture that kind of relation between the new wild dogs in Gongos and our elephants. Um, although I, I, I know I could see even by just uh, by watching the film that uh, the, the range area is overlapping. So it is really the same area that they all use, even when the female alpha was trying to find a place to, to den outside the park, for example, is actually the same kind of ranging area of some elephants. So, but I, uh, I think they still have to, you know, try to see this relation between wild dogs and elephants. Unfortunately, I haven't seen it in the park yet. Um, and I don't know, maybe the Dr. Apollo would have more insights about that uh, with the, you know, bigger herbivores, bigger mammals and wild dogs. Well, right. Tonegash, have you seen elephants and dogs interacting? Not yet. Uh, not. not yet. Yeah, we didn't see it. We yeah. still learning in the future. Yeah, yeah we can. Uh, we still learning. Yeah. Yeah, it's something to, any... for us to keep an eye open, actually, because I think that would be really interesting to see. Do you have any best guesses? I know it's hard, um, but do you have any <laughs> hypotheses of how wild dogs and, and elephants might interact? Is one going to be more frightened of the other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I think uh, on an elephant side, of, of course, uh, well, let's talk about a family group with young cows. I'm sure the females would be quite protective. And, you know, if in any chance the wild dog will try to threaten the calf or something, they would be quite protective and, you know, kind of bunch together and, you know, um, the same way some elephants do make uh, some lions run away. I think that would happen. And, uh, but, but I think on the wild dog's perspective, I think they would be quite curious. I, I see them quite curious about, you know, the other things. I, I remember seeing some videos previously that they were kind of exploring. I don't remember if that was, um, um, was, was another herbivore, but not in a hunting way. So I'm not sure how that would be, but, you know, based on what we see in other places, um, yeah, there will be kind of protective and curiosity towards maybe both. Yeah. And we do see a lot of interactions right now with elephants and with people. Uh, the film mentions that there is no border between the national park and where people in Mozambique live. And so Dominique, do you want to talk about how your team is kind of mitigating this relationship so that people and elephants can coexist? I thought this was super cool. <laughs> Uh, the thing is, there's no physical, like, huge bo uh, barrier between the southern uh, part of the park with the buffer zone around the park. And uh, the only barrier is the Punga River, which is easy for elephants and many other things to just cross to one side and another. And one of the things we do is not just my team, but it's actually a multi-departmental team, including here, Dr. Paula Tunekas and others that are in Gungos at the Sustainable Development and Science. And one of the things we do is that we use um, one of this, uh, this amazing technique or idea that uh, was firstly proved in Kenya by Dr. Lucy King, which is using beehives and bees to stop elephants to crossing and grading crops. So this is uh, the coexistence work we do and um, is mostly focused in collaborating with our communities, our community collaborators and us and providing these resources and teaching the techniques and basically um, focusing at, at this moment, we're focusing mostly on these crossing points that some of them are actually like runways for elephants, you know, and certain times of the night and day and location. So we kind of um, close these areas with this uh, nature-based fence, basically, which is having a set of beehives uh, stick together with ropes and suspended and closing that passage. So if the elephant tries to pass, it just shakes the, the rope, which agitates all the hives and the bees come out and sting them. Uh, it is proven to be quite effective in previous studies. And um, we have a actually some footage and camera traps and other things that it is working. It is also nice to hear from our community co collaborators that it is being effective. You know, there's less crop raiding, less elephants in the area. The only thing though, is that for this to fully, fully work perfectly, you would have to probably close the entire place because elephants are so smart that they, if I, we actually have that kind of thing on cameras that they just walk along these fences and trying to wait and see where they can go in or you know they push each other trying to see who is the brave enough to break that so it's just um they it is effective but not yet 100 100 percent so it will take us some more time to see a long time how that still fear and pain because it's also painful for elephants, how that helps change their behavior or perception of risk in this human shared landscape. It's just so cool. I mean, to think, <laughs> I think there's this perception that elephants are really afraid of little things. You, you think about elephants and, and mice and that cartoon that you've seen before, but just taking something so small as a bee and instilling fear in something as large as an elephant is just, so incredible and, and very creative. And speaking of little things, before we get to our viewer questions, I hope that everyone's dropping some questions or comments into our feeds on Facebook and YouTube. Definitely do that if you have a question, just submit a comment below. Um, before we get to that, I was hoping to share this clip 
of some of the African wild dog pups. There have been quite a few of them. <laughs> Little things before we get. Ten months after Barra's first litter of pups was lost to a python, camera traps record the dawn of a new era. With the addition of 11 newborns, the wild dog population is nearly doubled. Then a surprising development. A second female delivers a litter of her own, and her eight pups are welcomed into the pack by Barra and raised along with the others. And pups in the park just keep on coming. Four adults split off and form their own pack, and its alpha female delivers another eight pups. With these three litters, the wild dog population of Gorongosa has jumped from 14 to over 40. So Taneka, if you had mentioned there are now 83 wild dogs yes. in the park. Yes. We had this explosion of absolutely adorable puppies. <laughs> is that okay for the ecosystem? Does nature find a way? Because I imagine that means that there are more hungry mouths to feed. There are going to be fewer of these grazing animals that they're feeding on. What happens when you get more predators? What happens to the prey? And do things kind of bounce back over time? Uh, Dominique, pode traduzir? Yeah, uh, ela estava a perguntar uh, se é ok, é, é bom para a natureza ter esse tipo de rápido crescimento de muitos mabecos. O que vai acontecer à medida que os mabecos aumentam? O que, é que vai acontecer com as presas? Vai simplesmente o número? Como é que vai ser? Qual é essa relação? Imagina, temos muitos mabecos e isso é bom ou não? O que, é que pode acontecer? Ok. Uh... Atualmente, para a área que nós temos, este número ainda é insignificante, porque esta população ainda pode ser frágil, porque são muito suscetíveis a doenças e facilmente podemos perder uh, esta população por causa das doenças. E é muito frágil, como a raiva, as ganas e carinhas. Então, essa população pode crescer e o gráfico também pode decair a qualquer momento. E para nós é bom. E... Ainda precisamos mais. Esta população tem que crescer mais para ser estável. Com o número que estamos agora, ainda precisamos mais. He says that uh, at this moment, this population is quite not really significant to have a large, large effect in the, in, in the ecosystem per se. So because this population is quite fragile still, so if something happens such as pathogens or disease, we could still have a crash in that population and maybe not really reach any, any kind of, uh, you know, point of turning, turning point for the, the entire ecosystem. Right, and we have a question from Enid on Facebook. They're wondering if there are teaching programs you would all recommend for younger conservation activists, maybe people who are interested in studying these trends or helping out with conserving their local environments. What can they do? Training mm. programs, uh, just generally, or, or ways to engage with the project? I would say ways to engage with their local projects, or mm. uh, is there any educational experiences that they need to pursue, or anything that they can do outside of a traditional school environment? Uh, Dominique, do you want to talk about WildCamp? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, at least uh, for for young people, people uh, that is not in Mozambique or not able to come to the park and join some of, as Paula said, if you you 
we're not taking volunteers at this moment, but if you come, we will have work for you. So uh, to do as volunteer, but um, if you just far, uh, there's a this amazing thing that is said also by the Old Huge uh, Medical Institute in partnership, which is a welcome Gorongosa. So some of our colleagues have this massive grid of camera traps in the park where we register a lot of uh, information on our, on our wildlife. So Wild Cam Gorongosa is really a good um, tool just for education, all ages, uh, all interests, and you kind of, uh, you perfect, uh, you kind of get a profession and identify animals just based on parts of the body and color or things like that. So you get to know more about the, the wildlife in Gorongosa and at the same time, you're really helping the researchers because uh, going through camera trap data is really time consuming. <laughs> and uh, we all need this kind of engagement from everyone that could you know, help us doing that. And you get a lot of experience uh, by, and also knowledge about our wildlife in Gorongosa. So Wildcam Gorongosa is definitely one thing we would recommend. Um, other things, uh, also, there's a lot of resources these days, uh, especially in Instagram. Um, if you want to know more also about other little things, especially little things uh, in Gorongosa and things that maybe camera traps might not uh, peak, you can see Gorongosa Map of Life, uh, which is an Instagram account where the director of the E.O. Wilson Birdvest Laboratory in the park runs it and you see amazing pictures and information and educational material about other li little things that we have in the park. Yeah. And I have to add, if you are um, already an in education institution such as university and other things, the, the, at least the, the, the scientific department do take students. Uh, is just go through the process of uh, application and uh, research applications and permits and getting everything ready. And then you would be maybe allowed to come and do some research in the park. And either with a um, new university or other universities that, that are already involved with the park. Yeah. Speaking of these other animals that live in Gorongosa, do the three of you have a favorite species? Is it what you study, or I should say study primarily, or is your favorite actually something else? <laughs> Yo, that's a tough question. Um, wow. Dominique, you go first. <laughs> uh, that's not fair. Um, of course, we, we're all very biased here because of our primary subject, right? Our primary animal. But I have that to say, sense. I do, there's a few other ones that I, I remember mentioning as my, my uh, big five, although there's nothing to do with size or anything, and was sable antelope, which I completely adore sable antelope. It's, I, it's just the way they, they look so beautiful and poised and everything. I also really love um, uh, the, the small one that is always uh, on an oribi, the small antelope. <laughs> and of course, who would not like pangolins, right? At least so as it's still is this rare and mysterious thing. And when we see, it doesn't matter how many times you see, it's just fascinating. So this would be my tree. <laughs> That's awesome. Pangolins are so, so stinking cute. <laughs> so those are great <laughs> choices. <laughs> what about you, Tanaka? Um, yeah. Uh, I can talk in Portuguese, Dominique, pode traduzir. Ela disse para escolher quantos? Se tem alguns outros animais que tu gostas muito ali no parque, não, não precisa ser os que, com, com que tu trabalhas, mas qualquer outro que tu gostas muito. É, yeah. por ser veterinário, primeiro diria que gosto quase todos. <risos> mas muito de grãos coroados, pássaro, é pássaro muito favorito, muito querido, e também é, admiro tanto os mapecos. Tenho mapeco favorito, <risos> chamamos de Yamagaya, Cleopatra. Yeah. E quando estava no Boma, quando ainda estava no Boma, é, deixou compuser. Tive grandes, tenho grandes recordações dela quando estava no Boma, daquilo que era o comportamento dela, é, porque passei muito tempo a ver ela no Boma, então é, estimei bastante estar com ela muito perto e 
adorei. E outro também que eu gosto também é o leão. É, o nosso, é a nossa bandeira e não tem como não gostar. E também, como tenho uma boa experiência de ter convivido muito tempo com o Leão, uh, adoro aquele rugido e fascinante. <risos> Okay, uh, Tuneka says that because he's a vet, he loves every animal, <laughs> but uh, he said that he really likes, um, which is the ground hornbill. Uh, it's one of, uh, we have actually a very healthy population, ground hornbill in Gorongosa, and he loves it. And he says that uh, he had a really good time or experience. He learned a lot from Cleopatra, which is Namagai, I think, the, one of the females of, from the wild dogs. So he learned a lot just observing when she was in the Boma. And of course, it's one of the, the favorites. I think I missed one, though. The Sesti Grau Coroado, Mabeku Jilke. And the lion, yeah. And of course, the lion. <laughs> I was wondering why, why I heard Cleopatra in there. I was like, mm, that must be someone's <laughs> name. <laughs> That's always yeah. amazing to develop your own personal relationship with a specific animal. It's really special. Um, let's look. Well, actually, Paul and, it, oh, I'm sorry. One thing to mention about the names um, of, of the Mabekush, the wild dogs and the lions is that um, in Gorongosa, for example, the wild dogs are named by the local kids from the eco clubs here surrounding the park. So the park runs these these eco clubs, and the kids got to come out. Uh, you'll see it in the in in part of the film, and and hang out with Tunekash at the enclosure when we were bonding the pack. And so each child got to name one of the dogs. So Nyamagaya is named by one of the kids, and um, and every dog from now on will be named. And so we have to keep track of a lot of, of names. <laughs> <laughs> it's very challenging and it's similar for the lions um our traditional leaders get to name all the new cubs that are born into the park now so that connection um yeah we have that connection to to the animals uh in the work that we do but one of the most important parts of our job is is helping forge that connection between the park and wildlife and the communities that are here too that's it's so important what an honor to get to name an animal that's just really special we actually we sent two of our, my colleagues down to antarctica a couple of years ago and they got to name a seal and wow. it just really <laughs> bonds you with that animal and and develops that genuine connection that's so special and i think at this time so important for us humans to develop I, connections I think... with with wildlife I think I should also say that, for example, Tunekas here, we do have a colored elephant named Tunekas. So, <laughs> yeah, so it is something we also do, but I, at least with the elephants, since it's less colored elephants, I try to name after some of colleagues and um, either men and women who has been working with in Gorongosa. So yeah, Tunekas do have an elephant named after him. <laughs> Dominique, do you yeah. like Tanekas the elephant or Tanekas the person better? <laughs> oh kidding. my god. Uh, it depends <laughs> because Tanekas the elephant sometimes do give us some trouble, <laughs> especially when he leaves the park and Tanekas the person knows about that. Actually, we, we colored all elephants together. So it was quite nice. We, we also, Tanekas and I, the person are good friends since uh, when we started and uh, it was quite nice for us to do that work together. So I think it's a special thing, <laughs> right? So we have a question from Paul on Facebook. This is going back to African wild dogs and the number of dogs that we'd like to see in the park. Um, is there a target number of individual African wild dogs that you would like to see in Gorongosa? Um, yes. Yeah, so all of the conservation goals that we set are based on science, right? We, we try to use, we, we put data to work to try to understand what our goals are. And so before we even flew over the first pack, we tried to understand how many dogs could live in this park and thrive. 
Um, with wild dogs, we actually don't think of them as individuals. We think of them as groups, right? The pack, the family unit. And so we came up with a, a, a mile marker, a goal of eight to 10 packs, which could thrive in this park. Um, so, so yeah, it, that, could, that could mean we'd be at around 150 individuals. But really, again, when you think of a wild dog population, you're thinking about packs, not individuals, because they need each other to survive. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're about, a, I'd say, halfway towards our goal. But, um, you know, with time, they're going to have to compete with lions. They'll be competing with leopards, with spotted hyena. So as that plays out over the years, um, that's where the science comes back into it, to keep a close eye and monitor that evolution over time. And that relationship, what you have going on there in Gorongosa, it seems to be mirrored by uh, these other instances, like what we had in Yellowstone National Park here in the US with the reintroduction of wolves into the park and that then balancing the number of hooked mammals that you had in, in Yellowstone, whose population was really exploding. And you know, this is a really hot topic where I live in Colorado now, it's actually on the ballot to potentially release wolves back into the Colorado ecosystem where they historically were. And so I'm curious when people are thinking about this and thinking about these policies and these relationships and maybe concerns about interacting with these animals and maybe in a negative way, how can we mitigate those relationships but ultimately prioritize doing what's best for these natural environments? Is it just a matter of learning from Gorongosa and other places or? So are you asking about balancing the human wildlife coexistence? Yeah, yeah that's a huge and complex topic. Um, on the carnivore side, we actively manage that. So we are unfenced and every now and again, a, a pack of, of these painted wolves, these, these wild dogs will leave the park or lions will leave the park but they very quickly come back. So the park is, is really good habitat for them. There's a lot of prey, it's secure, there's no people. So they have, you know, they can, they can roam freely. Um, but when a pack does stray out of the park or a lion does stray out of the park and isn't coming back, we actively intervene. Um, we, we will go get them. Uh, so that's that mitigation aspect. But the other component is the coexistence and, and the education and forging those human bonds with, with the wildlife um, in this area. Dominique can talk a lot about that too when it comes to elephants. It's such a complex um, realm, right? There's so much work to be done on so many different levels. Everything from intervening, um, directly with the animals that leave the park to working with the humans that live on those boundaries um, towards coexistence. All right, thank you. That was a great, great answer. Dominique, do you have anything to contribute? Uh, not much, actually. I think Dr. Apollo said it well. It's, it's also about balancing because I, I do tend to see coexistence as also dynamic <laughs> because people as well as animals, we, we both uh, adapt, we get that equilibrium, and then one of us may want more or something around may change and you want something different or, you know, evolve more or something. So I see it as also a balance and, you know, trying always, the, the equilibrium is dynamic actually, changes over time. And it's, as the Trapola said, it's not only about getting collaborators or communities, but it's also that other education part, which uh, we do try. And also, depending also a lot of who you're involving, uh, many of our uh, of other interventions would mainly focus on men and, you know, uh, older men and this, because they do play a leadership role in our communities and many communities, but then, um, it's actually the women or the children that would also do things that are more harmful. So it's something that we're also already tackling that, you know, bringing the women in because then they, these are the mothers that's going to teach this new relationship with wildlife to their children. 
and actually helping us in maybe a few years after this. Uh, so it's something that uh, has different layers, it's complex, uh, it's dynamic. So it's something I don't think, you know, we might say we want to achieve coexistence, but we also want to keep rolling on that coexistence because I don't think it's a state that is just, you know, stuck. Well, that's amazingly put. And um, we can't, not talk about pangolins. You know, these are animals that are highly trafficked. They're also highly adorable and a really important part of your ecosystem in Gorongosa. I know it didn't make it into the film, but we do have an extra clip um, really focusing on Seneca's role as the head veterinarian in the park. And one of the scenes within that video was him bathing this pangolin and it's possibly the cutest thing I've ever seen. And so Tanekis, what is your relationship with these animals and what role do they have in Gorongosa? Dominique, uh, pode trazer? No vídeo, no outro vídeo, tu, tu estás, tu és protagonista, tu estás aí com os pangolins, a alimentá-los, a mostrar tudo. Então ela pergunta qual é a, a conexão, a relação que tu tens com os pangolins e por que eles são, os pangolins são importantes para Gorongosa? Uh... Uh, tem uma conexão muito, como posso dizer, forte com esta espécie animal. Porque é uma espécie que está a sofrer muito pelo tráfico ilegal. E quando nós olhamos o pangolim, uh, poucas pessoas conhecem o pangolim. Poucas pessoas sabem uh, que o pangolim é o animal mais traficado do mundo. E para mim, por saber que o pangolim é o animal mais traficado do mundo, uh, encoraja a uh, a estar mais conectado, a fazer, a dar o máximo uh, para conseguirmos fazer o melhor, tipo, quando são resgatados, uh, para darmos em termos de carinho, uh, porque chegam já, como tinha explicado muitas vezes nos vídeos, uh, o pangolim chega deprimido, por, ma por maus tratos, às vezes cansados, uh, esfomeados, então, quando eu recebo aquele animal naquele estado, uh, choca-me bastante. Por isso, dou o máximo de carinho uh, e também faço os, todo o esforço possível para conseguirmos alimentar, para depois libertarmos na vida essa voz. Para mim, Ok, naquele... deixa, deixa eu traduzir. <laughs> I need to translate this and then I'll keep uh, with the other part of the question. So next he said that as a, vet, as a vet in the park, of course, he has a strong relation with pangolins because uh, they are so important and only a few people really know that pangolin is the most trafficked mammal in the world. And for him to see them, to see that we haven't, have them and then most of the times when Tuneka is received these pangolins, these pangolins are beaten, are sick, are depressed, are hungry. So it kind of takes a lot from his art also to take care and kind of like give carinho is how we say love, for example, to those animals. So it's kind of a, I would say it's a very empathetic connection as a vet to, to see an animal suffering that way. So he tries to, to do his best to provide. So now I'm going to ask the other part of the question, which is what, how important they are for the ecosystem. Uh, por que é que os pangolins são tão importantes para o ecossistema da Gorongosa? Uh, os pangolins, como outros animais, cada animal tem um papel importante no ecossistema. E o pangolim não foge a regra. O pangolim é o mais próximo aos carnívoros. E o pangolim consome formigas. Algumas vezes são pragas. Uh, insectos, e naquele ato de escavação que ele faz, uh, favorece a mistura do solo com algumas plantas e também facilita o arranjamento do solo. E assim vai melhorando a qualidade uh, do solo e também melhora a disponibilidade de pasto e para além de consumir cerca de 70 milhões de, de, de formigas. É maravilhoso o papel do pangolino no ecossistema. So the role of the pangolin in the ecosystem is really wonderful because uh, Tunekas actually say that they're very close as carnivores because they consume a lot of insects such as ants and other 
things that we would call pests. So at that moment, that action of digging up and the soil, so the pangolin can feed, feed himself, uh, kind of mixtured parts of the soil with the biomass that was on the top, so permits that the hair flows into the soil. So it's it's a very important ecological role for fertilization and aeration of the soil. So it, it is what I would also call uh, ecosystems engineers. Yeah. Exactly. Ecosystem engineers or kind of farmers. They're they're cultivating the soil mm -hmm. and allowing other things to grow and flourish and that creates this whole really healthy ecosystem for all the other animals that you have there. Very cool. Well, I think we're going to wrap things up pretty quickly. If anyone has any last minute questions um, on Facebook or YouTube, definitely send them our way. But it's been such a pleasure talking to the three of you today and also watching Nature's Cure Factor last night. It's really thrilling and exciting. And your work is just absolutely incredible. Thank you for having us, Suki. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, if you haven't yet seen the film, definitely check it out. You can stream Nature Scare Factor online or on the PBS video app. It will live on our website for all eternity. So absolutely check it out sooner than later. But if you don't have a moment this week, then don't worry, you can definitely watch it next week or later on. Um, and we also have quite a cool collection of short form videos that are related to the film uh, from scenes that didn't make it into the final cut. 